Chapter 6, Section 3. But surely market forces will stop abuses by the rich? Unlikely. The rise of corporations within America indicates exactly how well a general libertarian law code would reflect the interests of the rich and powerful. The laws recognizing corporations as legal persons were not primarily a product of the state, but of private lawyers hired by the rich, a result with which Rothbard would have no problem, as Howard Zinn notes, quote, The American Bar Association, organized by lawyers accustomed to serving the wealthy, began a national campaign of education to reverse the Supreme Court decision that companies could not be considered as a person. By 1886, the Supreme Court had accepted the argument that corporations were persons and their money was properly protected by the process clause of the 14th Amendment. The justices of the Supreme Court were not simply interpreters of the Constitution. They were men of certain backgrounds, of certain class interests. People's History of the United States, page 255. Of course, it will be argued that the Supreme Court is a monopoly, and so our analysis is flawed. In so-called anarcho-capitalism, there is no monopoly, but the corporate laws came, uh, came about because there was a demand for them. That demand would still exist in, such, in so-called anarcho-capitalism. Now, while there may be no Supreme Court, Rothbard does maintain that, quote, the basic law code would have, been, uh, would have to be agreed upon by all the judicial agencies. But he maintains that this, quote, would imply no unified legal system, even though any agencies that transgress the basic libertarian law code would be open outlaws and soon crushed. This is not apparently a monopoly. The Ethics of Liberty, page 234. So you either agree to the law code or you go out of business. And that's not a monopoly. Therefore, at least we anarchists think our comments on the Supreme Court are valid. If all the available defense firms enforce the same laws, then it can hardly be called competitive. And if this is the case, and it is, when private wealth is uncontrolled, then a police judicial complex enjoying a clientele of wealthy corporations whose motto is self-interest is hardly an innocuous social force controllable by the possibility of forming or affiliating with competing companies. This is particularly true if these companies are themselves big business and so have a large impact on the laws they are enforcing. If the law code recognizes and protects capitalist power, property, and wealth as fundamental, uh, as fundamental, any attempt to change this is initiation of force. So the power of the rich is written into the system from the start. And we should add, if there is a general libertarian law code to which all must subscribe, where does that put customer demand? If people demand a non-libertarian law code, will defense firms refuse to supply it? If so, will not new firms looking for profits spring up that will supply what is being demanded? And will that not put them in direct conflict with the existing pro-general law code ones? And will a market in law codes not just reflect economic power and wealth? David Friedman, who is, from, uh, who is for a market in law codes, argues that, quote, if almost everyone believes strongly that heroin addi addiction is so horrible that it should not be permitted anywhere under any circumstances, anarcho-capitalist institutions will produce laws against heroin. Laws are being produced on the market, and that's what the market wants. And he adds that market demands are in dollars, not votes. The legality of heroin will be determined not by how many are for or against, but how high a cost each side is willing to bear in order to get its way. Machinery of Freedom, page 127. And as the market is less than equal in terms of income and wealth, such a position will mean that the capitalist class will have a higher de effective demand than the working class and more resources to pay for any conflicts that arise. Thus, any law codes that develop will tend to reflect the interests of the wealthy, which brings us nicely on to the next problem regarding market forces. As well as the obvious influence of economic interests and differences in wealth, another problem faces the free market justice of so-called anarcho-capitalism. This is the general libertarian law code itself. Even if we assume that the system actually works like it should in theory, the simple fact remains that these defense companies are enforcing laws which explicitly defend capitalist property and so social relations. 
Capitalists own the means of production upon which they hire wage laborers to work, and this is an inequality established prior to any specific transaction in the labor market. This inequality reflects itself in terms of, of differences in power within and outside the company and in the law code of so-called anarcho-capitalism, which protects that power against the dispossessed. In other words, the law code within which the defense companies work assumes that capitalist property is legitimate and that force can legitimately used, be used to defend it. This means that, in effect, so-called anarcho-capitalism is based on, uh, upon a monopoly of law, a monopoly which explicitly exists to defend the power and capital of the wealthy. The major difference is that the agencies used to protect that wealth will be in a weaker position to act independently of their paymasters. Unlike the state... The defense firm is not remotely accountable to the general population and cannot be used to equalize even slightly the power relationships between worker and capitalist. And needless to say, it's very likely that the private police forces will give preferential treatment to their wealthier customers, what businesses do not, and that the law code will reflect the interests of their wealthier sectors of society, particularly if prosperous judges administer that code. In reality, even if not in theory. Since, in capitalist practice, the customer is always right, the best-paying customers will get their way in this society. For example, in Chapter 29 of The Machinery of Freedom, David Friedman presents an example of how a clash of different law codes could be resolved by a bargaining process. The law in question is the death penalty. This process would involve one defense firm giving a sum of money to the other for them accepting the appropriate anti- or pro-capitalist uh, capital punishment court. Friedman claims that, quote, as in any good trade, everyone gains. But this is obviously not true. Assuming the anti-capital punishment defense firm pays the pro one to accept an anti-capital punishment court, then yes, both defense firms have made money and so are happy. So are the anti-capital punishment consumers, but the pro-death penalty customers have only perhaps received a cut in their bills. Their desire to see criminals hanged, for whatever reason, has been ignored. If they were not in favor of the death penalty, they would have not subscribed to that company in the first place, after all. Friedman claims that the deal... Uh, that the deal by allowing the de anti-death penalty firm to cut its costs will ensure that it keeps its customers and even get more. But this is just an assumption. It's just as likely to lose customers to a defense firm that refuses to compromise and has the resources to back it up. Friedman's assumption that lower costs will automatically win over people's passions is unfounded. As is the assumption that both firms have equal resources and bargaining power. If the pro-capital punishment firm demands more than the anti can provide and has larger weaponry and troops, then the anti-defense firm may have to agree to let the pro one have its way. So all in all, it's not clear that everyone gains. There may actually be a sizable percentage of those involved who do not gain as their uh, desire for capital punishment is traded away by those who claim they would enforce it. In other words, a system of competing law codes and privatized rights does not ensure that all consumer interests are met. Given unequal resources within a society, it's also clear that the effective demand of the parties involved to see their law codes enforced is drastically different. The wealthy head of a transnational corporation will have far more resources to, available to them to pay for his, uh, his or her laws to be enforced uh, rather than one of their employees on the assembly line. Moreover, as we argued in Chapter 3, Section 1, and will do so in Chapter 10, Section 2, the labor market is usually skewed in favor of capitalists. This means that workers have to compromise to get work, and such compromises may involve agreeing to join a specific defense firm or not join one at all, just as workers are often forced to sign non-union contracts today in order to get work. In other words, a privatized law system is very likely to skew the enforcement of laws in line with the skewing of income and wealth in society. At the very least, unlike every other market, the customer is not guaranteed to get exactly what they demand simply because the product they consume is dependent on, uh, on other within the same market to ensure its supply. You, the unique workings of the law and defense market are such as to deny customer choice. We'll discuss other aspects of this unique market shortly. 
Wyke, Wyke sums up by saying, quote, any judicial system is going to exist in the context of economic institutions. If there are gross inequalities of power in the economic and social domains, one has to imagine society as strangely compartmentalized in order to believe that those inequalities will fail to reflect themselves in the judicial and legal domain, and that the economically powerful will be unable to manipulate the legal and judicial system to their advantage. To abstract from such influences of context and then consider the merits of an abstract judicial system is to follow a method that's not likely to take us very far. This is, by the way, a criticism that applies to any theory that relies on a rule of law to override the tendencies inherent in a given social and economic system. For discussion of this problem... Um, uh, as it would surface in attempts to protect the environment under so-called anarcho-capitalism, there are addended, uh, 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 there are addendums on this document. There is another reason why market forces will not stop abuses of the rich, or indeed stop the system from turning from private to public statism. This is due to the nature of the defense market. For a similar analysis of the defense market, see Tyler Cohen's Law is a Public Good, The Economy of Anarchy in Economics and Philosophy, number 8, 192, uh, published in 1992, pages 249 to 267, and rejoinder to David Friedman on the Economics of Anarchy in Economics and Philosophy, number 10, published 1994, pages 329 to 332. In so-called anarcho-capitalist theory, it is assumed that competing defense companies have a vested interest in peacefully settling differences between themselves by means of arbitration. In order to be competitive on the market, companies will have to, be, uh, have to cooperate via contractual relations, otherwise the high price associated with conflict will make the company uncompetitive and it will go under. These companies that ignore decisions made in arbitration would be outlawed by others, ostracized, and their rulings ignored. By this process, it is argued a system of competing defense companies will be stable and not turn into a civil war between agencies with each enforcing the interests of their clients against each other. However, there is a catch. Unlike every other market, the businesses in competition in the defense industry must cooperate with its fellows in order to provide services for its customers. They need to be able to agree to courts and judges, agree to abide by decisions and law codes and so forth. In economics, there are other more accurate terms to describe cooperative activity between companies, collusion and cartels. Collusion and cartels is where companies in a specific market agree to work, with, uh, work together to restrict competition and reap the benefits of monopoly power by working to achieve the same ends in partnership with one another. In other words, this means that collusion is built into this system with the necessary contractual relations between agencies in the protection market requiring that firms cooperate and by doing so to behave effectively as one large firm and so effectively resemble the state even more than they already do. Quoting Adam Smith actually seems appropriate here. People of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Wealth of Nations, page 117. For example, when buying food, it does not matter whether the supermarkets I visit have good relations with each other. The goods I buy are independent of the relations that exist between competing companies. However, in the case of private states, this is not the case. If a specific defense company has bad relations with other companies in the market, then it's against my self-interest to subscribe to it. Why join a private state if its judgments are ignored by others and it has to resort to violence to be heard? This, as well as being potentially dangerous, will also push up the prices I have to pay. Arbitration is one of the most important services a defense firm could offer its customers, and its market share would be based upon it being able to settle interagency disputes without risk of war or uncertainty that the final outcome would be accepted by all parties. Therefore, the market setup within the so-called anarcho-capitalist defense market is such that private states have to cooperate with the others or go out of business fast, and this means collusion can and will take place. In other words... A system of private states will have to agree to work together in order to provide the services of law enforcement to their customers. And the result of such cooperation is the creation of a cartel.
However, unlike cartels in other industries, the defense cartel would be a stable body simply because its members have to work with their competitors in order to survive. Let's look at what would happen after such a cartel is formed in a specific area and a new defense company desires to enter the market. This new company will have to work with the members of the cartel in order to provide its services to its customers. Note that so-called anarcho-capitalists already assume that they will have to subscribe to the same law code. If the new defense firm tries to undercut the cartel's monopoly prices, the other companies would refuse to work with it. Having to face constant conflict or the possibility of conflict, seeing its decisions being ignored by other agencies and being uncertain what, um, what the results of a dispute would be, few would patronize the new defense company. A new company's prices would go up, so face either folding or joining the cartel. Unlike every other market, if a defense company does not have friendly cooperative relations with other firms in the same industries, then it would quickly go out of business. This means that the firms that are cooperating have but to agree not to deal with the new firms which are attempting to undermine the cartel in order for them to fail. A cartel-busting firm goes out of business in the same way an outlaw one does. The higher costs associated with having to solve all of its conflicts by force, not arbitration, increases its production costs much higher than the competitors, and the firm faces insurmountable difficulties selling its, profits, its products at a profit, ignoring any drop of demand due to fears of conflict by actual and potential customers. Even if we assume that many people will happily join the new firm in spite of the dangers to protect themselves against the cartel and its taxation, i.e. monopoly profits, enough will remain members of the cartel. Perhaps they will be fired if they change. Perhaps they dislike change and think the extra money is worth peace. Perhaps they fear that by joining the new company, their peace will be disrupted or the outcomes of their problems with others too unsure to be worth it. Perhaps they're shareholders and want to maintain their income. So... That cooperation will still be needed, and conflict unprofitable and dangerous. And as the cartel will have more resources than the new firm, it could usually hold out longer than the new firm could. In effect, breaking the cartel may take the form of an armed revolution as it would with any other state. The forces that break up cartels and monopolies in other industries, such as free entry, Although, of course, the defense market will be subject to oligopistic um, uh, oh, uh, tendencies as any other, and this will create barriers to entry, do not work here. And so new firms will have to cooperate or lose market share and or profits. This means that defense companies will reap monopoly profits and, more importantly, have a monopoly of force over a given area. Hence, a monopoly of private states will develop in addition to the existing monopoly of law and this de facto monopoly of force over a given area, i.e. some kind of public state run by shareholders. New companies attempting to enter the defense industry will have to work with the existing cartel in order to provide the services it offers to its customers. The cartel would be in a dominant position and new entries into the market either become part of it or it fails. This is exactly the position with the state with private agencies free to operate as long as they work to the state's guidelines, as with the monopolist to general, general libertarian law code. If you don't toe the line, you go out of business. It's also likely that a multitude of cartels would develop within a given cartel operating in a given locality. This is because law enforcement would be localized in given areas as most crime occurs where the criminal lives. Few criminals would live in New York and commit crimes in Portland. However, as defense companies have to cooperate to provide their services, so would the cartels. Few people live all of their lives in one area, and so firms from different cartels would come into contact, so forming a cartel of cartels. A cartel of cartels may perhaps be less powerful than a local cartel, but it would still be required, and for exactly the same reason a local one is. Therefore, so-called anarcho-capitalism would, like actually existing capitalism be marked by a series of public states covering given areas, coordinated by larger states at higher levels. Such a setup would parallel the United States in many ways, except it would be run directly by shareholders without the sham of democratic elections. Moreover, 
as in the United States and other states, there will still be a monopoly of rules and law, the general libertarian law code. So so so-called anarcho-capitalists claim that this will not occur, but that the cooperation needed to provide this service of law enforcement will somehow not turn into collusion between companies. However, they are quick to argue that renegade agencies, for example, the so-called mafia problem, or those who reject judgments, will go out of business because of the higher costs associated with conflict and not arbitration. However, these higher costs are insured because the firms in question do not cooperate with others. If other agencies boycott a firm, uh, if, uh, if other agencies boycott a firm but cooperate with all of the others, then the boycotted firm will be at the same disadvantage, regardless of whether it's a cartel buster or a renegade. The so-called anarcho-capitalist is trying to have it both ways. If the punishment of non-conforming firms cannot occur, then so-called anarcho-capitalism will turn into a war of all against all. Or at the very least, the service of social peace and law enforcement cannot be provided. If firms can't deter others from disrupting the social peace, one service the firm provides, then so-called anarcho-capitalism is not stable and will not remain orderly as agencies develop which favor the interests of their own customers and enforce their own law codes at the expense of others. If collusion cannot occur or it's too costly, then neither can the punishment of non-conforming firms and so-called anarcho-capitalism will then again prove to be unstable. So to sum up, the defense market of private states has powerful forces within it to turn it into a monopoly of force over a given area. From a privately chosen monopoly of force over a specific area, privately owned area, the market of private states turns into a monopoly of force over a general area. This is due to the need for peaceful relations between companies, relations which are required for a firm to secure market share. The unique market forces that exist within this market ensure collusion and monopoly. In other words, the system of private states will become a cartel and so a public state, unaccountable to all but its shareholders, a state of the wealthy, by the wealthy, for the wealthy.